Okay, so I'm going to be presenting some work that is largely the work of my recent, uh, excuse me, my recently graduated PhD student, Ted Roman, as well as an undergraduate in my group, Brenda Zhao. And this is work related to some of the topics we heard about in the previous two talks, specifically in the context of trying to deconvolve heterogeneous signals in tumor data. So this, pro this problem's already been explained well earlier in the session, so I hope I don't need to dwell too much on it, but essentially what we're trying to do is look at mixed samples, so samples in which we're assuming there are multiple cell types present, and we're trying to deconvolve the influence of these individual cell types, so reconstruct virtual profiles of single cells, at least at a coarse grain level of resolution, and figure out how these are distributed in distinct samples. So in the previous talks, this was mostly done in the context of looking at single tumors, so looking at multiple samples from one tumor, and what I'm going to be talking about today can be used in, in that scenario, but we're actually looking primarily at the context of where we may have many different tumors available, and we're trying to come up with an overall model of the major uh, progression states visited across the population of tumors. And we've been working primarily on uh, a set of approaches for this problem that are derived from an analogy between geometry and this unmixing or deconvolution problem. And what I'm going to be talking about today is very much focused on solving a specific computational problem that comes up in the context of working with this, and that is that uh, mixture modeling problem. So the class of methods we've been working with derive from essentially the in intuition that if you have a small number of basic components making up your mixed data, so a small number of cell types, and you put them in some sort of gene space, so maybe our coordinates are copy numbers of genes, expression levels of genes, then mixtures of those fundamental cell types should approximately lie on line segments between the two basic cell types. So if you can find the line segments, you can make an inference as to the endpoint of those line segments, which will give you an approximate model for the uh, fundamental cell components. If you had three basic cell types, you would expect to see triangles. By finding the triangles, you can get approximate inferences of those three basic cell types and so forth. So in general, if you had k different cell types, you'd expect k minus one dimensional simplices. And the problem then uh, we originally proposed is try to find these simplices as a way of reconstructing your cell mixtures. Now, if you do this directly, it doesn't quite work well on genomic data because genomic data, of course, is very noisy, and these geometric approaches can be quite sensitive to outliers in the data. So you can uh, pose this as a problem we refer to as hard unmixing, just finding a, a minimum volume simplex bounding your data, but that tends to be very noise sensitive. So in practice, what you really want to do is what we call soft unmixing, so that is to build in some noise tolerance. You can have some points are somewhat outside your simplices, and by balancing the fit of the simplex to the quality of the simplex in terms of, uh, again, originally minimizing the volume, you can get a much better fit to your data. And so that kind of approach we showed some years back can be used to get a, an approximate model of major states of progression over the course of development of a tumor that you can then use to build what's called an oncogenetic tree. So an oncogenetic tree would be a model where we have these inferred virtual cell types, in this case virtual copy number profiles of major states of progression of the tumor, and then build a, a kind of phylogenetic tree that's describing major pathways of progression, in this case across a patient population. So any particular tumor might be following more or less one pathway of progression through this tree, or perhaps in different tumor sites, movement among a small subset of this tree. So that basically is where things stood a number of years ago, but we know that this kind of approach is very imperfect. What we're actually seeing here and what we're able to reconstruct is much less than the true diversity of the tumor type. So we know from single cell studies that there is a lot more heterogeneity that we're not seeing. And so what we've been focused on is the problem of how deep can we go here? How much further can we go to dig into the real structure of the data and extract more resolution, better quality in these kinds of virtual single cell reconstructions? <laughs> 
And one of the things that has suggested to us from the beginning that there is more that we can do here is that the data really doesn't look like simplices. We would expect from this kind of model that if we really had a perfect representation of what we were seeing here, we might be seeing these kinds of simplices of data. And then by getting the simplices, we would get the virtual cell types. But what we see often looks like not a K minus one dimensional simplex, but more like a set of lower dimensional pieces stuck together. So these are a couple of older array data sets that we've worked with at various times from Jones et al, Navin et al, uh, an RNA copy number, or an RNA and a DNA data set. And you can kind of see there is a substructure to these that looks much more like low dimensional subsets in the data rather than a single high dimensional data set. And if you look at more modern data sets, these are a couple of the TCGA data sets, uh, in this case, both uh, uh, DNA copy number data sets. This comes out much more clearly. That there is this kind of simplicial structure. And we can just kind of as a cartoon draw what we think this looks like visually, that we are again seeing these sort of low dimensional subsimplices. And what we want to ask is, can we take advantage of that? Is there real information here that we can use to improve our ability to deconvolve complex mixtures like this? Now, if you want to do that, one of the first things we want to do is come up with a model, so a way of understanding this problem to suggest why we might be seeing this and why there might be information here we might be able to deconstruct. And it's actually not surprising that we're not seeing pure simplices, because if we really have data evolving, at least approximately according to an oncogenetic tree model, we would actually expect something more like these combinations of simplices we can sort of think we're seeing in our data here. So if we had a simple oncogenetic tree where perhaps there was a single kind of ancestral healthy cell state, which uh, progressed into a, a, a sort of average precancerous state, which could then branch in different directions for different tumor subtypes. What we would expect is not a single four vertex uh, three-dimensional simplex. We would expect what's called a simplicial complex. So a structure in which we have a pair of triangular subsimplices joined together by a single edge, where that edge would correspond to the common cell type shared between these two progression states, and then the expansion to the triangles would come from mixtures of those more advanced states that are only found in subsets of the tumors. So this is what I refer to as a, a structured uh, mixed membership model. And essentially the computational problem we're trying to solve is to be able to reconstruct these kinds of models. So to be able to take this kind of structure in the data set and ask, can we really reconstruct that from the data available to us? Now, this turns out to be a, a kind of problem, at least at a high level, is pretty well studied. So some of you may recognize this as a version of what's called a manifold learning problem. There's a lot of theory on this sort of geometry problem, a lot of theory on manifold learning. But it turns out that most of that theory does not work very well for genomic problems. So one of the big issues with this kind of data is that even though this may seem like a very big data set by genomic standards, it's a very very sparse data set by manifold learning standards. We don't have a lot of data points. In this case, if we were looking at TCGA data, we might have a thousand data points or so on a single tumor type. That is very small by the standards of this kind of manifold learning field. We also have very noisy data. That's not a good thing if you're trying to reconstruct low dimensional manifolds because noise looks like higher dimensions. Uh, you, you need to be very conservative in estimating the dimensions of your data. And we also have to deal with the problem that a lot of the theory in this field assumes you have a, 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 a effectively a very smooth, uh, continuous manifold. And what we are looking for is very specifically not smooth manifolds. We are expecting discontinuities, so discrete low dimensional subspaces joined together by low dimensional subsets. So it's a manifold learning problem, but a very non-standard one. Because of this, we've uh, been trying to come up with methods that can get around these sorts of problems and allow us to apply some of this theory to reconstructing the kind of structure that is in this data but is not so obvious uh, how to exploit. So we've come up with uh, what is really in many ways a very heuristic method for doing this, trying to take this apart into a set of discrete subproblems, each of which we can do a decent job of solving and then hope through a pipeline of these discrete steps, we can get at least approximately a representation of our overall manifold reconstruction. <laughs> 
So we start by dimensionality re uh, reduction. We just use PCA. Uh, it's a very simple method. We've tried some uh, nonlinear dimensionality reconstruction methods, but PCA actually turns out to be the best thing for us, primarily because it has very low data needs, and we have very low data by the standards of this field. Once we get dimensionality uh, reduction, we can then start worrying about our problem of discovering these subsimplices, and we try to cluster our data into these discrete subsimplices. Simplices. This can be represented as a kind of clustering problem, but again, it's not your standard clustering. Rather than separating two discrete clouds of points, for example, we're trying to separate one contiguous cloud, but falling into discrete subspaces of a higher dimensional ambient space. So we can turn this into a clustering problem, but we need some non-standard methods to do this. We end up using a, a version of what's called medoid shift clustering, but with a non-standard distance metrics and using what we call negative kernel uh, uh, clustering, which basically means you try to cluster by separating on extremal points rather than midpoints of your data set, and eventually get down to a kind of fuzzy clustering where we can assign points more or less to discrete submanifolds or to the boundaries between them where they may be contributing to uh, two distinct subsimplices. Once we do that, we're able to move on to the mixture modeling portion of this, so to separate the components of these submixtures using a version of our earlier soft unmixing approach where basically we use the, the soft unmixing, so trying to find simplices bounding our data sets. Uh, with some tolerance for noise in the data using a, a somewhat improved uh, sort of phylogenetic prior, essentially assuming our data is evolving according to a phylogeny and using a minimum spanning tree uh, measure of the quality of that phylogeny as a kind of approximation from minimum evolution prior. Turns out it's not necessarily a good assumption to say that these are evolving on a phylogeny, as we'll see when I, I get to some data, but it's at least a starting point to work with, as well as throwing in anti complex prior. We can then move on to the problem of trying to stitch these back together. So once we've got these mixture models of vertices for the subsimplices, we then try to figure out which vertices and discrete subsimplices might really be the same point being seen from different directions. We do this from a kind of analysis of nearby neighborhoods of points to try to figure out which ones have significantly overlapping neighborhoods. And that eventually gets us to some sort of simplicial complex model we can use to try to reconstruct this structure in our data and ask if this gives us a better way of resolving our mixtures. So there are a lot of details I don't have time to go into there. Uh, the high level picture I'll say is that this sort of works. It doesn't work as well as we'd like it to. And one of the reasons I like to talk about this is I hope that someone else out there has better ideas for solving these problems. But I want to go through some data and at least show you what it does, what it doesn't do, and where there's maybe room for improvement. So this is an example using the TCGA breast cancer copy number variation data. So what we see here are the, the different points representing copy number profiles of individual TCGA breast cancer tumors. The different point types describe different uh, breast cancer subtypes. So HER2 positive, the luminals we group together, triple negative. And what we're inferring here ends up being a simplicial complex of three one-dimensional arms branching off from a common point. You can kind of see that maybe if we were doing this manually, we might be able to do a somewhat better job. It's kind of a problem of keying on the uh, extremal points of your data that you can sometimes get your points a bit skewed from where you'd ideally like them to be. But that's what comes out of the method. We get a model that approximately is capturing the structure of this kind of data. And we can show that it's approximately capturing it in, in a few different ways. So we can look at correlations between the assignments of these points points to nearest vertices versus the assignments of the points to subtypes based on immunohistochemical assays. We can show that these vertices do correlate or anti-correlate with different tumor subtypes, which at least is saying it's approximately getting what we'd expect from the data. And we can look at term enrichment for significantly altered copy numbers at these vertices. This is just a few of the most significant terms popping up from a David analysis of the, of the sets of genes that show up as significantly gained or lost at the vertices. And we're at least seeing some of these that kind of make sense for what we'd expect to see in these data sets, so some specific to breast tissue, to breast carcinoma, and so forth. 
We can also apply this to RNA data as so the same basic approach. We end up with a different simplicial structure here. So in this case, we actually do get a single simplex rather than a simplicial complex. When we look at correlations with the uh, breast cancer subtypes, we again see these are correlating with the subtypes. The different vertices here are picking out distinct subtypes of breast cancers. When we look at term enrichment, we actually see something very different from what we see in the DNA, though. In particular, what we see in the term enrichment analysis is that a lot of the top terms popping up associate with this kind of central node and are actually terms related to immunology. So this is maybe not so surprising. We think what this is really keying on is immune infiltration. That's showing up as a significant differential effect. And of course, that's something you would pick out in RNA that you're not going to see in DNA. Immune cells look the same as any other healthy stromal cell, so you can't separate that from the DNA data. We also tried combining DNA and RNA, so normalizing the two data sets separately, bringing those together, and what we end up with is a more complex simplicial com complex model, so a uh, tetrahedral and a triangular simplex. The term enrichment actually ends up pulling up a lot fewer terms here because it's a more complex model. We don't really get a good association with the subtypes, although there are associations at the level of the subsimplices with the subtypes. The term association, we get many any fewer terms, but they're much more specifically terms related primarily to breast cancer. So this is suggesting that maybe we're actually losing a lot of sensitivity here, but gaining a lot of specificity by combining the DNA and RNA data. And I, so I think this is at least telling us that there is something to be gained by bringing these together. In some ways, they're complementary, although in some ways, they're actually confounding with one another. We were also interested in whether we could get improvements in survival analysis, so whether the, what we're able to pull apart in these kinds of data sets has some correlation with an unrelated phenotypes, the phenotypes of metastasis or survival. And this ends up being tricky from this data set because it's a very unbalanced set of labels. We did a kind of subsampling where we made balanced subsets of the data and asked whether we could predict metastasis from association with our terms. We end up with a pretty good accuracy. So about 91% accuracy in calling in these balanced subsets, the metastatic tumors. And when we do some Kaplan-Meier analysis to figure out what it's keying on, what we can essentially find is when you look at survival, primarily we're able to separate based on association with that central term, the one that is uh, uh, basically the healthy cells or infiltrating immune cells. Basically, that seems to be the most significant thing in allowing to pull out a survival difference. So how much uh, healthy cells are the purity of your tumor, immune infiltration. When we look at metastasis-free survival, it's more the differences between the subtypes that give us the most power in predicting uh, which, are the meta which tumors have good metastasis-free survival. But basically, this is saying this mixture model approach is telling us something meaningful about the uh, clinical outcomes of these patients. So just to wrap up, this genomic deconvolution does provide a strategy for reconstructing at some level clonal evolution of these single tumors. And there is structure in the, this data that we can pull out of there, but there are a lot of challenging computational problems to doing so. When we do this, we are able to get results that concur well with prior knowledge and do give us predictive power about future progression. I'll just wrap up by thanking those from my own lab who contributed to this work, our collaborators, financial support, and thanks to all of you for your attention. Hello. Thanks. A great talk. Um, I have a question. How do you decide on the number of individual mixture components that you use in your models? Uh, yes, yeah, so I, I, that's one of the points I kind of glossed over. So that ends up being another hard problem. So uh, essentially, you want to estimate the dimensionality of these point clouds after you've clustered them into subsimplices. And that's another problem where we're kind of at a limit of too little data and too much noise to do good dimensionality estimation. We end up using a variant of a technique called sliver estimation, where basically what you're trying to do is try different dimensions and ask whether you get good aspect ratios geometrically between subsets of points sampled from these. And when you start getting very elongated uh, slivers, that's telling you that you've lo you're looking at a dimension that's higher than is actually supported by your data. We need to tune this to be very conservative because 
because the noise is so high relative to the number of points, so it's probably greatly underestimating the true dimension of the data, but that, that's the approach that we found works best so far. Uh, but then how do you decide if you have two triangles that share an edge or you have a three-dimensional sibling, say? How do you distinguish between these two cases? So that, uh, th that's something that might be better solved by thinking of this as a single unified objective we're trying to optimize for rather than a pipeline. But for the moment, we're treating it as this pipeline problem. Okay. So we first uh, cluster to discover the subsimplices, and that's where we use this uh, negative kernel metoid shift approach to try to discover the subsimplices. And once we've discovered those, we say those are the subsimplices. We stick with these. And ag again, it may be something that you could do better if you were able to solve this as a single unified objective function, but that, that's not something we've been able to get working effectively so far. Hello. Thank you. Thank you for the interesting talk. Um, I have something similar to ask. Um, when you do the first dimensional reduction to the, uh, the PCA, um, how do you decide on the dimensionality there? Uh, yeah, so, so there we're, we're using uh, essentially a, well, that, uh, that actually comes back to the BIC prior. So we end up iterating through a few possible dimensions overall. And then later when we get to the, the mixture modeling, the BIC prior gives us a way of checking after the fact what a good PCA dimension is. But for the most part, what we found works well is that there's a kind of eigenvalue test you can use. Basically, you look for when you start seeing a gap in the eigenvalues, and that does about as well as anything else, although we're checking after the fact that we're getting a, a, a good model in terms of the, 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 the BIC prior on the overall fit at the end. And there, there aren't too many possibilities for the overall PCA dimensions. You can just iterate through all of them. Okay. Thank you. Um, there, there are similar methods uh, based on the convex hull. You maybe uh, know the method of Uri Alon's lab, or, uh, where they work. Uh, they construct a con convex hull, and then use Pareto optimality to to assign functions to cell types. Is that similar? Did you compare that? Uh, we haven't compared to their method. It is a similar approach. They're also using this kind of geometric model. It's a, it's a different way of posing the problems. We, we haven't actually compared head to head, so I can't say if this way of posing the problem is better than theirs, but they're both versions of uh, the, the, these geometric or archetype analysis approaches to the problem of reconstructing these mixtures. So we welcome the last